Welcome back, everyone. We are really happy to welcome you to our second session of the day. I am Rachel Lieberman. I am a director here at the Celiac Disease Center. I have the pleasure of working alongside Dr. Ritu Verma, who is our medical director, as well as Dr. Bana Jabri, who is our research director here at the center. And um, I'm also joined today with Valerie Abadie, Dr. Valerie Abadie, who is part of our planning committee, and she is a amazing researcher here at University of Chicago. We are so excited for our second half of gluten challenges and celiac disease. We had a great morning. I just want to go over some housekeeping notes. The first is I want everyone to really pay attention. At the bottom of your screens of this Zoom, there is a Q&A function. If you can make sure as our speakers are presenting and questions arise, please put all of your questions within that Q&A function. The chat is simply um, not for that purpose, and it keeps us organized as we um, have our panel discussion at the end of this session. I want you to know that this is being recorded if you have to drop off for any reason. This recording will be back up on this website about three days after our conference and will be posted. So if there's anything you'd like to re-review, it will be posted there. And after this conference today, we will be sending out information for um, receiving your CME accreditation. But I am so happy to be joined with by Dr. Valerie Abadie, who will be joining me to introduce our first speaker of the day. But um, we are so happy to have you and thank you for attending. So Valerie, I'll hand it over to you. All right. So and welcome everyone to this session entitled Gluten Challenge Induced Immune Response. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ludwig Solid, who is a professor at the University of Oslo uh, in Norway and a senior consultant at the Oslo University Hospital, uh, Rick Hospitalet. He's also the director of the, U uh, the University of Oslo Fossi Center of Excellence, and his research interests are focused around the, the study of the genetics and the immunology of celiac disease and uh, he's going to start this session talking to you to us about why do we do gluten challenge ludwig it's up to you you can share yes, your screen thanks. thank you valerie and greetings from oslo um so um these are my disclosures uh when pediatricians in europe made diagnostic criteria in the 1970s uh, celiac disease was considered a food hypersensitivity disorder and elimination provocation was really essential for the diagnosis and they took biopsies with active disease then after the gluten-free diet and then after the gluten provocation so i think gluten provocation really came with celiac disease as a food hypersensitivity disorder um in 2020, the European pediatricians made new diagnostic schemes. Um, and here, antibodies are really essential. And in Europe, they can make the diagnosis in children if the kids have 10 times the upper limit of normal of ant IgA antitransglutaminase antibodies. So this disorder has moved from the camp of food intolerance to the camp of autoimmunity. And our knowledge of the disease has changed as well. Um, but I think gluten provocation is still an essential part, and it actually has helped us to understand the disease um, in our research. And this is now 30 years ago uh, when we started to grow T cells from biopsies of patients with um, celiac disease. These patients were in remission, and we were challenging uh, the biopsies with gluten antigen in vitro, in culture, and we can grow T-cells, and we can get T-cells that recognize gluten. And what we discovered was that these T-cells recognize gluten peptides when presented by HLA-DQ2.5 or HLA-DQ2. So a T-cell has a T-cell receptor, which is recognizing a peptide and antigen, and that is presented by an HLA molecule. And what was notable was that there are many other HLA molecules on the surface, different variants on the surface of these antigen presenting cells, but it was only the HLA DQ2.5 that could present the gluten antigen. And as you know, HLA DQ2.5, as well as HLA DQ2.2 and DQ8, they are associated with celiac disease. And with this study really showed that what 
these HLA molecules do is to present gluten peptides. And I think it also told us that celiac disease is caused by an adaptive immune response to gluten involving these gluten-specific T cells. So celiac disease has to do with adaptive immunity. And the adaptive immune system, as you probably have learned a lot during the COVID pandemic, um, has some specific features. One is that they have antigen receptors that recognize antigen. I just told you about the T cell receptor. Um, there is also, when these immune cells see antigen, there is clonal expansion, and there is also memory. And there are two types of adaptive immune cells, T cells and B cells, and both of them behave in the same way, so that they clonally expand. There is clonal uh, some clone contraction, but you still have memory T cells and memory B cells. And these B cells produce antibodies. So the antitransglutaminase antibodies are produced by B cells or other B cells that differentiate into plasma cells. Whereas these T cells recognize their antigen with their T cell receptor when it's presented by HLA or MHC molecules. And uh, there is also another feature of the adaptive immune system, and that is recall. So after the first encounter, you have this clonal expansion. There is a clonal contraction, but there is still many more cells than it was in the naive repertoire specific for this antigen. And on antigen re encounter, there is clonal expansion, and these cells respond more vividly. And that is really the sense what's happening during gluten provocation, that the immune system, the adaptive immune system, the T cells, and also the B cells, recognize gluten antigen and respond more vigorously. And over the years, over these 30 years, we have learned a lot about uh, the adaptive immune response. And one of the things we learned is what are the parts of gluten which are recognized by um, T cells. And this is a sequence of a typical gluten protein. And you see it has pink P, which is proline, and blue Q, which are glutamine. And this protein is hard to digest for the gut enzymes. And there are uh, long fragments, and this was work we did together with Chaitin Korslet Stafford, he will hear later today. Um, so, some long peptides which survive this gastrointestinal digestion. And in these peptides, there are certain glutamine residues, which are targeted by this transglutaminase enzyme and converts them to um, glutamate. So in the gut, there are modified peptides. And this is what binds to these HLA molecules and stimulate the T cells. And when the T cells recognize these gluten peptides, the T cells get activated, they secrete cytokines, and I often describe them as the director of the immunological orchestra. They ask the orchestra to start to play. So um, this is a busy slide, but basically it shows that you have these gluten protein, which get modified, and this enzyme transglutaminase, which is essential in the antibody response. So the patients make antibodies to this enzyme. Also has a function to modify gluten peptides to make this conversion of glutamine the Q to E. And the peptides which has these glutamate residues, the E's, they are colored red here, and that is what binds to these HLA molecules and which stimulates the T cell uh, when the T cell recognizes it with its T cell receptor. And then these T cells become activated. They secrete cytokines, most notably gamma interferon, a cytokine called IL-21, and a cytokine called IL-2. These T cells, these CD4 T cells that recognize gluten is also instructing cells, T cells, which sits within the epithelial cells. And these cells then can start to kill off enterocytes. And that is the reason why you get this villus atrophy um, and crypt cell hyperplasia as a compensation. So we could use various techniques to isolate these cells. Um, and I will get back to that later in my talk. But basically, we could isolate single cells which are recognizing gluten. And we were then sequencing the genes for the T cell receptor. And that functions as a fingerprint. So T cells with the same T cell receptor basically comes from the same clone. So we can follow clonotypes in patients over time, both in blood and in the gut. 
And when we did that and sampled um, blood or gut biopsies with weeks and years apart and looked for how many of the clones were shared between the different time points, we observed that after 10 weeks, the amount of sharing was about the same as after one year. And also in our liquid nitrogen tank, we had samples from patients more than 20 years ago. And also here, it was the same level of clonal sharing. And this told us that these T cells, once they have been established, they sit here for many, many years. And that is the reason why celiac individuals have to stay on a gluten-free diet for life. Uh, these T cells, which we started growing, they were coming from biopsies in the upper small bowel. But the initial activation of these T cells and how these B cells and T cells are interacting happens in specialized immune organs of the gut, which are called Peyer's patches, isolated lymphoid follicles and mesenteric lymph nodes. But here these T cells get activated and then they get a signal that they should travel through blood and then populate these in the intestine um, to sit there as guardians. And if gluten is coming along, they get activated and you get the celiac reaction. But it, this also allows us to sample these cells in blood because they are traveling to blood and circulating. And this was um, what um, Bob Anderson utilized when he then did a gluten challenge and looked for specific cells using a technique called Elispot, which basically measures the cytokine produced by T cells, gamma interferon. And he was then able to see that in the majority of celiac patients, when uh, these T cells were in blood were stimulated with gluten, there was um, a, a response by gamma interferon secretion. And he also found that these T cells expressed a homing marker for the cells to the gut and they were captured in blood, but they were destined to go to the gut. And he also found, as we found, that they are using HLA-DP2 to recognize gluten peptide. Uh, he observed that if you do this in a patient with active disease, you could not see a response. But after two weeks on a gluten-free diet, and more so after eight weeks, you could readily detect these um, gamma interferon producing T cells. And he could also observe that these T cells were found in higher numbers on day six as part of this recall response. So we have used a tool which is called HLA DQ tetramers. And basically, what we have done is to produce in the laboratory the HLA molecule. And we have also produced them with the gluten peptide that the T cells recognize. And we are then putting them on a scaffold and and display many copies of this, which then will allow us to stain the specific cells. So we can stain the T cells that recognize gluten. And this has allowed us to really characterize these cells in detail. And this was what we utilized when we did this sequencing of their T cell receptors of the single T cells. And this is uh, from our initial publication on this and sh where we use T cell clones, so replicates of a single T cell, which we grow in the laboratory. I can see that these tetramers really stain specifically depending on which gluten peptide the T cells are recognizing. And we could replicate the finding of Bob Anderson that these T cells, they are a much higher number on day six in blood. Um, so um, when the patient who is in remission is challenged with gluten, on day six, there are many such gluten specific T cells coming out in the blood. Um, and this is a response to two different T cell epitopes, one we call alpha-1, one we call alpha-2. And you see that uh, for this epitope, all the patients responded. For this epitope, all but two patients responded. And we did not see this in, in uh, health individuals, whether or not they expressed DQ2. And we also found that these T cells were expressing this beta-7 integrin, which tells us that these cells are destined to go to the gut. Uh, using these tetramers and looking for clonotypes, so basically we are sequencing the T cell receptors, getting the fingerprint of single cells. We can then follow um, cells during a gluten challenge, a 14-day gluten challenge. And these are the cells which we 
fingerprinted that baseline. And then we took a blood sample on day six. We also took a blood sample on day 14. And we can see that, as Bob Anderson showed, that these cells are peaking on day six. And we can also see in biopsies taken at baseline and at day 14 that there is an increased number of gluten-specific cells in the, in the gut, which kind of makes sense that when you see these cells in blood and they have a marker so that they should go to the gut, they end up there and sitting there as guardians waiting for their prey. And we could also see using this fingerprinting that the clones which were present before we did the gluten challenge were also those which expanded which we found on day six and which were present on days 14. So that means that all these typical features you see of the adaptive immune system is something which is replicated in the response to gluten. The immune system is using its good soldiers to respond and they are they, the, uh, sitting there to protect the, the, the person or the host. Using these tetramers, we observed one thing and I think this was briefly mentioned earlier today, that um, when you do a 14-day gluten challenge, not all of the patients get histological changes as seen in with a, with a biopsy examination. However, um, most of the patients respond with these gluten-specific T cells on day six, suggesting that this may be a better marker for whether or not you're responding to gluten, whether or not you're making this recall response. However, one problem using this test is that there is huge variation in the number of T cells. So this is the number of gluten-specific T cells which express this beta-7 integrin per million CD4 cells. So you see that there are not many, but you see that there's a huge range. So how do you then tell whether there's, this is sufficient numbers to, to make the diagnosis? And Jason Tidin is going to tell you about another measure of this activation of T cells, which is re release a wild two, a cytokine. And again, here, there's huge variation. Um, these T cells, when they recognize gluten, they get activated. And one of the markers they use as an activation marker is a molecule called CD38. And even though the number of the T cells varied, they had a uniform change in that they all started or almost all started to express this CD38. And looking at when they started to express these CD38 molecules, we can see that uh, maybe some of them are even having higher expression on day eight than day six. So that these T cells can gain and lose markers is interesting. And this was studied in detail by uh, Oscar and Christofferson, who had been a postdoc in our lab and who went to Mark Davis's group at Stanford. Who, um, and Mark Davis was the one, his laboratory invented these HLA tetramers, where you can specifically isolate and study T cells. Um, and we were using our tetramers. We expressed them with five different gluten epitopes. We had, since these T cells are very few in blood, we had to use them in enrichment. And we also used negative control to, to um, be sure that we stain the cells specifically. And we then typed them for many markers. And this is just showing that these cells express the beta-7 integrin, alpha-4 beta-7, so they are gut homing. And also they were negative for CD45RA and CD62L that we knew from before. So these are what we call effective memory T cells. What Osborne then discovered, and which was a big surprise at the time, is that these T cells, which are gluten specific, they have a very distinct phenotype. And this was so, so this plot basically shows um, phenotypes of all T cells. And if T cells have similar phenotypes, they group together. And you can see that the gluten specific cells were grouping very closely together. And we did not see them in blood of, of healthy individuals. And when Ospin was staining cells with uh, in biopsies with these tetramers, again, these uh, gluten-specific cells had a very distinct phenotype, which was not observed. Cells with this phenotype was not observed in controls. And Ospin characterized these by this um, phytop staining, um, which gives this, where you can analyze many parameters, as well as doing uh, RNA 
sequence analysis basically showing which transcripts, which mRNA do these cells have. And based on this, we could come up with a kind of a, a, a picture of which markers do these gluten-specific T cells express. Um, and for immunologists, these and markers um, tells us something. One of them is that they are probably interacting with B cells. Uh, Osborne, when he came back to Oslo, he followed up together with other people in our group, where he then looked at markers, what happens during gluten, oral gluten challenge. And these patients had a three-day challenge. The bloods were sampled on day six. They were stained with HLA tetramers. Uh, and then he isolated um, T cells, which had this gut homing uh, phenotype and which were um, effective memory cells. And these were also subjected to RNA-seq analysis and then um, mass atometry. And based on this, he could then see which markers do they have. And what he observed was that these cells um, at baseline were basically grouping into two um, clusters. However, upon the gluten challenge, they were all moving into this cluster here, the cluster two. So these cells are then, when you do the oral gluten challenge, they lose some markers, for instance, CD127. Some of the cells in the patient in remission have uh, expression of a marker, which is called CXCR5, which uh, is interesting from an immunological point of view because it's a marker of follicular helper T cells. Um, but on gluten challenge, these markers disappear, and there are many markers that come up, including CD38, which I explained to you. And also there are other markers like PD1, CD28, and ICOS, which, is up, which are upregulated. And basically the phenotype, the phenotypic markers of these T cells on day six after an all gluten challenge is very similar to what we observed with the T cells in untreated celiac patients. There are some differences, for instance, that this CD39 is not expressed on day six. So it needs longer time than six days to be upregulated. And this, um, the fact that these cells have this very distinct phenotype allows us to follow them. Uh, and we don't need to use HLA tetramers only to get hold of them and to study them. And this has been used to identify T cells gluten-specific T cells where we did not know which gluten peptide they were recognizing. So we identified some additional gluten T cell epitopes. So um, what, why do we do the gluten challenge? And basically it is to monitor the specific recall T cell responses to gluten. And we're utilizing that these gluten-specific T cells increase in blood on day six. This allows us to characterize the cells. We can sequence the T-cell receptors. We can characterize which phenotypes they have. And this allows us to tell what are these T-cells doing during uh, celiac disease. And this can be harnessed for diagnostic purposes. There are some challenges, as I told you, that uh, the patients respond differently, at least in the numbers. They have more uniform um, uh, features when it comes to activation markers on these T cells. And last but not least, this gluten challenge has become really important for development of new drugs for celiac disease. So um, these are the people in my group who over the years have worked with uh, um, gluten reactive T cells. I think I mentioned Ospion, but there are others, Shu Wang Chao, Melinda Rocky, Mikhail Bot, Luis Risnes, Iva Dahal Parala. Marketa Shlibnova, we have got clinical material primarily from Knut Lundin, and there are many, many patients who have contributed with biological samples. Um, and um, Eivind Lund helped Ospion with characterization of these um, T cells uh, analyzed with Cytov, and this was then done in the lab of Mark Davis. We had a long standing collaboration with Chaitin Koshler's group at Stanford. So, thank you for the attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Salad. Valerie, do you want to go ahead and introduce our next speaker?
Our next speaker is Dr. Jason Tidin. So Jason, uh, Dr. Jason Tidin is in Australia. So for, and it's in the middle of the night right now. So he has pre-recorded uh, his talk. So the Dr. Tidin is an associate professor at the Walter and Eliza uh, Hall Institute of Medical Research in Victoria. And he's an adult gastroenterologist with an expertise in the management of celiac disease, gluten related disorders, food sensitivities and intolerance. Um, and he's gonna talk to us about about uh, the study of uh, IL-2 release that Dr. Solid touched a little bit upon uh, that is used for the identification and monitoring of gluten-induced uh, immune responses. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to talk today. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak to everyone around gluten challenge and interleukin-2 studies. And I'm very sorry that I can't be with you all in person. So here are my disclosures. So today's session, you'll hear a lot about uh, the role of gluten challenge uh, in understanding disease biology, its role in the diagnosis of celiac disease, and also its important role in drug development. Uh, and at the core of all of this is really an understanding of how gluten triggers off specific immune effects as a readout in celiac disease. So you would have heard very nicely from Professor Solid already around the central role of the gluten specific T cell in celiac disease. So I don't need to cover this uh, much at all. Um, you would have heard that interferon gamma is one of the key cytokines liberated by the activated gluten-specific T cell. And when you look at the chronic lesion in celiac disease, or you study biopsies incubated with gluten, or you study T cell lines or T cell clones, um, or you look at gluten peptide installation studies, interferon gamma is a very key cytokine. But you can see here on this slide a range of other cytokines and chemokines that have been associated with the chronic lesion of celiac disease, including interleukin-2. So measuring these gluten-specific T cells can be challenging. And again, Professor Solid would have covered these areas, but broadly speaking, we can think of functional T cell assays uh, to, to assess these cells. Um, because the frequency of gluten-specific T cells in peripheral blood is so very low, um, these approaches are only really effective after a gluten challenge. And traditionally, a three-day gluten challenge with sampling of the peripheral blood uh, six days after starting the challenge has been employed to really detect these cells through uh, alley spot approaches or ELISA approaches. Uh, it doesn't work in everyone and, and three days of gluten are required. So uh, another approach is to utilize Tetrama technology to detect these T cells. Um, the beauty of this is that a gluten challenge isn't required. However, this approach does require substantial expertise, particular panels, knowledge of the HLA type specific to the patient and relatively high volumes of blood. Now, whilst both these approaches are enormously informative and have helped the field greatly over the years and will likely continue to do so, they are not ideally suited for clinical trial sites or uh, standard patho pathology labs. So the question is, is there another way to track and measure the gluten-specific T cell? So this information really comes from a development program of an immunotherapy uh, and you can read about this particular immunotherapy phase one trials in the top publication and the phase two trial in the bottom publication. This immunotherapy was made up of three uh, peptides that encompass a range of uh, immunodominant epitopes designed to target and activate T cells. Now, during the phase one studies of this immunotherapy after injection of uh, the the uh, agent, there was an increase in a range of cytokines and chemokines detectable in peripheral blood. And you can see that it was detectable after injection of the immunotherapy, but not after placebo injection. And also quite strikingly, the elevation of these cytokines um, correlated with the presence of vomiting uh, or, and also the severity of nausea. So there was this correlation between their magnitude of elevation and how severe how sick someone was to the uh, exposure to these peptides. 
the level of IL-2 elevation also correlated with the frequency of tetrapositive T cells specific for these dominant epitopes, suggesting that indeed there was a correlation with the T cells um, producing the IL-2. And this was supported by in vitro studies performed by Professor Solid, which showed that both gluten-specific T cell clones and also T cell lines did produce IL-2, although admittedly the amount was uh, lower and for a shorter duration than that of interferon gamma. And this observation may explain why some of the earlier studies of biopsies in um, celiac disease may not have shown a strong interleukin-2 signal. But importantly, other cells like B cells didn't produce IL-2, and cells like dendritic cells did produce IL-2, but wasn't in a gluten-specific manner. So in collectively, it's likely that the gluten-specific T cell, once it's activated by gluten ingested uh, or injected, um, produces this cytokine signature. Now, a key to this research was the use of ultra-sensitive cytokine detection technology. Uh, one example is the MSD machine, the other is the single molecule array. Um, this approach, the MSD approach, utilizes a particular tag that's conjugated to the detection antibody uh, when the analyte is bound to the capture antibody which is on the surface of an electrode and a current is applied, um, then a specific light signal is produced that can be measured and can quantify that specific cytokine. And you can see on this slide just how low the detection limits are. And we're talking down to the femtogram per mil level. And compared to other more traditional approaches like cytometric bead array or Luminex, these approaches tend to be uh, more sensitive, have higher dynamic ranges, and are very robust. So what happens if a person with celiac disease actually ingests gluten? And so we know that it is uh, strikingly similar in uh, what into what we see after the injection of gluten peptides. So again, a, a similar range of cytokines and chemokines are elevated. Uh, and again, this um, signal is dominated by interleukin-2. And when you uh, assess uh, gluten challenge in people without celiac disease, there's really no signal to measure. Again, there was uh, a correlation between the magnitude of elevation of these cytokines and the severity of gastrointestinal symptoms experienced by patients with celiac disease, as shown on this slide. Um, the time course of elevation is typically around two to four hours after gluten ingestion, and the peak is typically four hours after ingestion, although some cytokines came up earlier, like interleukin 17A, and some came up later, like CXCL9. Also important to note is that most of these are T cell derived. However, having said that, um, some such as CXCL9 or um, MIG are produced by other cells such as monocytes, macrophages, or epithelial cells. And so it's um, still unknown, but a lot of research needs to be undertaken to understand the types of cells involved in liberating these cytokines and chemokines and what their role is with respect to gluten induced symptomatology. So it's important to note that this elevation in interleukin-2 is highly sensitive, but also specific for celiac disease. So the study on the left compared the elevations after a gluten challenge in people with celiac disease versus those who were healthy volunteers. And there was a very strong elevation in those with celiac, but not healthy volunteers. And similarly, when you compare groups of people with celiac disease, to those with self-reported gluten sensitivity, you can get that differentiation again based on diagnosis. And interestingly, of the three people with supposed celiac disease who did not have an IL-2 elevation, um, they had extended gluten challenges. Two of those three were subsequently shown not to have celiac disease after that. Extended gluten challenge did not lead to any villus atrophy. However, the third person unfortunately couldn't tolerate a long enough gluten challenge to get this assessment done. 
So when we look at loosen challenge in a large number of people with celiac disease, we show um, some very striking similarities in how people respond. Um, now, this was in the immunotherapy phase two trial where people had an open label gluten challenge. These are people with, who are adults with treated celiac disease and had 10 grams of vital wheat gluten that was low in FODMAP. FODMAP being a fermentable carbohydrate often found in wheat that can trigger gastrointestinal symptoms like caused by irritable bowel. So it was low in FODMAP content. And pa participants did develop gut symptoms gut symptoms such as nausea, abdominal pain, uh, diarrhea and loose stool, um, and extra intestinal symptoms were tiredness and headache. Now people could experience symptoms within an hour of the oral challenge, but it typically peaked around three hours after ingestion of the gluten. And it was notable that nausea and vomiting accounted for most of the more severe AEs, adverse events reported, and about one in five participants actually vomited to the gluten. Now, when this was repeated again, uh, approximately five months later, this was very reproducible in terms of what people experience with the same kinds of symptoms the next time and the same kinds of interleukin-2 elevation, although this was more pronounced the second time around. And I'll talk a little bit about this in the later slide. Notably, older patients or those who had older age at diagnosis or those who were DQ2.5, particularly those who were homozygous at the DQB102 um, allotype, were more likely to be associated with um, higher levels of interleukin-2 to the gluten challenge. So there is this kind of gene dose effect that we see uh, that impacts symptomatology and the immune response to gluten challenge. Now, this very nice study based in the US by Drs. Leonard and Sylvester really examined what happens after a two-week gluten challenge of either three grams or 10 grams of gluten daily. Now, this equates to around four and a half grams or 15 grams of vital wheat gluten. And these are participants with celiac disease who had interleukin-2 measured at four hours, but also went on to have traditional um, alley spot and tetra tetramers measured on day six or histology measured uh, on day 15. And you can see quite nicely there that the uh, IL-2 level, even at the low dose of three grams, was informative after four hours, whereas histology was not. And really, the findings help support the notion that the assessment of IL-2 after four hours to a single dose, small, small level of gluten, is informative as to the gluten-specific T cell and really overcomes the need for more protracted and extended gluten exposure that would be necessary if you were using histology as the readout. So this really opens up another way we can undertake gluten challenge in an informative manner, particularly in the context of clinical studies. So you would have you will hear today about extended gluten challenges, which are particularly important when histology is the endpoint. Typically, these are six to eight weeks or longer, although many more recent studies have employed two week oral gluten challenges. Um, there will there is discussion around simulated intermittent gluten exposure trials to simulate real world accidental gluten exposure, particularly for therapeutics that are designed to protect against low grade intermittent exposure. And now we have the ability to do single bolus gluten ingestions coupled with the IL-2 readout. So this is a real world example of that approach being used. This particular immunotherapy, uh, and this is an, a different immunotherapy to the one I spoke about previously um, was given to uh, people with celiac disease. You can see here the IL-2 data, the placebo arm has um, as expected an increase with a peak at four hours after uh, the oral gluten challenge. Uh, but you can see there that at the two low doses of the drug, there was also a similar pattern, but at the higher dose of the drug, um, four out of six patients uh, don't have that high peak in interleukin-2. So it was a way to read out efficacy in a trial. But I think, and as I mentioned before, it's important to bear in mind that gluten challenge is very contextual and it can prime responses 
for subsequent, two subsequent gluten challenges. So coming back to this study of 295 people with celiac disease who had the open label gluten challenge, 36 of them had placebo treatment with drugs. So there was no immune modifying agent given to them. And then approximately five months later, they had a repeat gluten challenge. Um, and this was sham controlled. They did not know if they were having gluten or if they were having a placebo challenge. Um, and this second time around, uh, vomiting was twice as frequent and serum IL-2 levels at four hours were twice as high on average. So there was almost this kind of priming effect and we could postulate this is due to expansion of the gluten-specific T-cells from the first gluten challenge. Okay, so continuing with this theme that gluten challenge effects are highly contextual, chronic symptomatology in celiac disease is not the same as acute symptoms. Chronic symptoms represent, in most cases, the effects of the enteropathy caused by ongoing sustained gluten exposure in people with celiac disease, whereas acute symptoms are typically reported in those people with treated celiac disease who are subsequently intermittently exposed to gluten. And we know that those responses typically are acute, they are common, uh, they interestingly tend to reduce if gluten challenge is continued. Um, and uh, the explanation for that phenomenon is not yet understood. Um, we know this from studies in children when the old ESPGAN guidelines required people to be re-challenged with gluten in order to make the diagnosis of celiac disease. And when gluten was reintroduced into those people already on a gluten-free diet, um, but, um, by a month later, symptoms, the frequency of symptoms had halved. So with extended gluten exposure, the acute symptomatology does modify, but why this happens isn't entirely clear. And again, contrasting the difference between chronic and acute symptoms is this nice Finnish study that was recently published in two separate cohorts of adults with celiac disease. On the left, 815 adults with celiac disease. And at presentation, vomiting really only was a feature of 3% of the presentation of people uh, at the time of presentation. Whereas in this separate cohort on the right of 76 people with celiac disease, 19%. Um, so again, virtually one in five people vomited to an acute gluten challenge. This is important because patient reported outcome measures, which is an, a clinical outcome assessment tool we use, uh, and the FDA and other regulatory bodies require these clinical outcome assessment tools to be used when there's subjective symptoms like symptoms um, being assessed. And so patient reported outcome measures are a, a, a very important way we can assess the effect of a drug and um, regulatory bodies like um, companies to do that. But if you look at these, this is a summary of the PROs that are often used in celiac disease, the top two being the most frequently used, the CDSD or the CD Pro, they do not measure vomiting. Um, and really these have been designed on the basis of patient self-report. And in fact, the only um, um, celiac PRO measure on this table that measures vomiting is the CDAQ, uh, but that's not really all that focused on symptoms compared to quality of life. And we know from um, these double blind um, sham controlled gluten challenge studies is that nausea and vomiting really are the major symptoms linked to interleukin-2 elevation after gluten, telling us that these are very real symptoms, but many other symptoms are not. And it's very likely that functional gut symptoms can confound interpretation of results. And interestingly, patient recall of their symptoms or what they expect to experience after gluten challenge matches very poorly with what they actually experience. Again, telling us that patient recall uh, is not that accurate. So it's likely that um, many of the readouts that we record in PROs are not always going to be reflective of true patient reported celiac related gluten induced symptoms. All right, so can we move forward and 
develop ways to measure interleukin-2 in a way that doesn't require gluten challenge? And the answer appears to be yes. So based on a similar system to quantiferon gold in the assessment of tuberculosis, this is a whole blood assay. And when whole blood is incubated with gluten peptides, um, you can detect in the supernatant elevations in interleukin-2, as well as in gamma interferon and other cytokines such as interleukin-10. But again, interleukin-2, particularly when coupled to the ultra-sensitive cytokine detection tool, is, is uh, the most sensitive way to do this. And in uh, the studies quoted below, they, um, we also looked at a uh, alpha-glide and peptide a peptide library showing that this approach could map T cell epitopes accurately. And it was also informative in an immunotherapy trial as a way to track gluten specific T cells. We are now conducting a community study in Australia looking at people with and without celiac disease. This is still ongoing. So this is very much unpublished data, but you can see here that the this is a whole blood sample collected from people. On the left are people on a gluten-free diet with negative celiac serology. And they have a single blood, blood sample taken. It's incubated with the gluten peptides um, overnight and then interleukin-2 is assessed. And you can see that in treated and untreated celiac disease, we can detect a signal compared to those with healthy who are who, who don't have celiac disease or who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And of note, in the treated group, there were quite a few who were on immunosuppression because of coexistent other conditions. Um, and so these are likely to be false negative. Um, and then there were a few first degree relatives that came up positive in this, the healthy group that are now being worked up uh, with extended gluten challenge to just assess to see what what is really happening in that group. Um, so this is still a work in progress, but the data is promising that such an approach may allow us one day to differentiate between um, patients with and without disease. So I think in um, summer uh, putting things all together, I think that um, the IL-2 approach is a way to track the gluten-specific T cell and assess its reactivity. This can support celiac disease diagnosis and is a biomarker for gluten-induced symptoms. And doing the gluten challenge will also allow us to understand those people who have gluten-induced symptoms and we can correlate that with objective readout of IL-2. Um, this may inform the future design of patient-reported outcome measures we are utilizing this tool and we have utilized this tool to assess the immunogenicity of purified oats extracts, the avenin protein, to assess um, immunogenicity between patients. And there is a current threshold study underway to look at the low, lowest levels of gluten that can trigger T cell activation in people with celiac disease. So there's a whole um, realm of potential research projects that can be informed by this such by such a tool, epitope mapping and tracking T cells over time using the whole blood assay is another uh, other important um, approaches. And the whole blood assay is particularly favourable because there's no need for gluten challenge, so you don't actually prime T cells and contract them in their de novo state. Um, and moving forward, this platform really provides an approach to assess other diseases where T cell responses may be detectable or wherever alley spots are used, you could potentially use these approaches. And so this is ongoing work in other diseases. So I think that there's still lots of challenges in this space. Um, I think gluten challenge itself needs to be standardized. Um, we need to understand the mechanism for gluten induced symptoms. And we have some insights now into the role of uh, acutely activated T cells and interleukin-2 and other cytokines and chemokines. But how this all works to generate downstream symptoms is still unknown. We know serotonin may be important, but how these link together isn't, hasn't yet been explained. Um, developing PROs relevant to celiac disease, both the chronic symptoms of celiac, but also separately the acute symptoms of celiac disease will be important. I haven't touched on much pediatric work today, and that's because there isn't a whole lot. And I think this is going to be very, very important moving forward. Um, 
we need to appreciate that the people who undertake gluten challenge studies are a particular type of person. Those who are highly symptomatic will tend to avoid gluten uh, challenge studies. Um, and we know that there's a sizable proportion of asymptomatic patients. Um, but moving forward with um, studies that involve gluten challenge is really important. We develop ways to engage uh, people with celiac disease and explain the importance of gluten challenge and ensure that they can participate in these studies. I think that the immune readouts that have been developed are providing newer ways and advantages over current tools, um, particularly by minimising the amount of gluten um, provided to patients. And I look forward to seeing how these tools move, um, move the field forward, both with basic discovery and clinical trials and as a diagnostic. And on that point, I think that if we can simply measure the gluten-specific T cell as the key cell underneath celiac disease, then it may be possible to reconsider a future where celiac disease can be redefined more as an immune illness rather than being based on the enteropathy. So on that note, I'm just going to finish there and thank all our collaborators and supporters. Um, thank you again for your time today and the invitation to speak. Um, and I look forward to uh, catching up with you in person at some stage. Thank you. So after this great uh, presentation, I have the pleasure of introducing Peter Green. So Peter Green is uh, a professor at the University of Columbia uh, in clinical medicine. He is also the director of the Celiac Disease Center. Peter has played a major role in increasing awareness for celiac disease in the United States at a time where it was uh, not really recognized, and uh, he has created a really outstanding center in New York. So Peter, and he's going to tell us about the importance of gluten challenge in clinical trials. Thank you, Banner, and thank you, Valerie, for including me. I've enjoyed the talks very much. Um, so I'm going, so I was asked to talk on the importance of gluten challenge. With celiac disease have actually been undergoing gluten challenges uh, forever, virtually. As was mentioned earlier, previously to diagnose celiac disease, individuals had three biopsies. An initial biopsy that demonstrated villus atrophy, a follow-up biopsy that showed healing, and then the patients were instructed to undergo a gluten challenge that extended for up to two years and then had a third biopsy. So these patients had an extended gluten challenge. And in this Espergan paper that was published in as recently as 2012, um, there was a questionnaire that asked pediatric gastroenterologists about the diagnosis of celiac disease. And at that stage, only 12% of respondents were using the gluten challenge. And this prompted the development of the criteria to diagnose individuals based on serology alone. It was actually the development of serology testing for celiac disease that, that uh, got me interested in celiac disease because when the adult gastroenterologist started using serologies, we found that the real life situation wasn't nearly as good as the uh, research situation using these antibodies. And so that really got me interested in looking at celiac disease. And it's quite apparent that individuals with celiac disease are undergoing gluten challenges all the time. And this has become particularly evident since we can assess gluten exposure by looking and detecting these gluten immunogenic peptides in the stool and urine of subjects. And so this was a paper that was first authored by Jocelyn Sylvester, um, looking at a cohort of Canadian patients that were very good celiac patients. And this was a doggy bag study 
in which gluten was looked at in the food that the individuals collected over this period, and also looking at stool and urine for these gluten immunogenic peptides. And actually 12 of these 18 patients had gluten exposures over a 10 day period. The amount varied from 0.2 to 80 milligrams. And most exposures were actually asymptomatic. And this is a little table of the number of positive samples and uh, like it was 8% of food samples, uh, these gluten immunogenic peptides were detected in 6% of urine samples, 11% of stool. And here's some time sequences. So these were controls, three controls demonstrated the triangles were the urine detection of the gluten peptides. And you can see that these different celiac patients we're getting different levels of exposure intermittently. The urine is in the triangles and the red outside them were the positive values. And you can see just the amount of exposures that some individuals were getting. So this is like a mini gluten challenge. Um, so this appears to be quite common. And this is another study that was recently published from Argentina that looked at these gluten immunogenic peptides in uh, celiac patients in Argentina. And you could see here that people could be divided really into the amount of the categorization of adherence based upon this detection of these peptides, individual. So, some were super inherent, whereas 25% of these individuals who were attempting a gluten-free diet were very frequent or permanent gluten exposure patients. So my point here is that individuals who are attempting to be on a gluten-free diet are getting exposed and having these mini gluten challenges very, very frequently. This very good study that uh, Maureen, who spoke earlier today, uh, first authored, is the study coming out of Boston that evaluated responses to gluten challenges. And they used a randomized, double-blind, two-dose gluten challenge trial in which these 14 adults with celiac disease were randomized to either three or 10 grams of gluten. And as Jason just pointed out, both the three grams and the 10 grams demonstrated positivity when using this short-term IL-2 determination and both had symptoms, but it was only the 10 gram group that was positive for these other parameters, including histology. And so you can see here the effects of histology, and here the IL-2, demonstrating that individuals really needed this larger exposure apart from when one looked at this short-term exposure and could use the IL-2 determination. And then Joe Murray just joined us, and I want to mention his study here in which he looked at, and his group looked at IL-2 and symptom response after acute gluten exposure in subjects with celiac disease, comparing them to non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And he used a three gram challenge. And the results of the study demonstrated that in the celiac disease patients, symptoms did not differentiate between gluten and sham. So patients can't determine based on symptoms when they're getting exposed. The celiac patients and the non-celiac gluten sensitive patients couldn't pick the gluten from sham. Gluten didn't change mucosal permeability in this dosage. And the increase in IL-2 only occurred in the celiac patients. 
Now, it isn't necessary to demonstrate efficacy of a drug because the drug needs to protect against gluten exposure. And this is one of the early studies looking at glutenase ALV003. That we now now call lati glutenase, and they used a two gram gluten challenge and demonstrated that the use of the drug protected against the damage caused by two grams gluten exposure. In the villus to villus to crypt depth ratio, whereas the placebo did not protect. So this is an example of how the gluten challenge of a two gram daily for six weeks, it was used to demonstrate efficacy of the drug. However, when the drug was used in a more extended study, and this was the um, lattic glutenase study in a real life situation, 494 patients were enrolled. This was a very big study, very expensive, um, a lot of cooperation amongst all the celiac community, both the investigators and the patients. And it enrolled, the study enrolled patients with symptoms and evidence of villus atrophy. So these patients were getting gluten and would be appropriate candidates for the use of lattic glutenase, the enzymes to degrade the immunogenic gluten peptides. And in the study consisted of uh, these six different arms, placebo and five different treatment groups. And unfortunately for this study, there was no difference in the histology or symptom scores. But what was very important to notice was that symptoms started to improve in the run-in period. And therefore, we considered the results of the study due to the fact, this Hawthorne effect of the patients actually being in the study and changing their behavior. And when we looked at the other large study that we we're all involved with, the lorazotide study, in which the drug was used compared to placebo, and the placebo being the white arm and the other colored lines represented the different dosages of lorazotide, you saw exactly the same thing. This reduction in symptoms in the run-in period, the placebo group, as well as all the other arms, noted this reduction in symptoms. So it's quite apparent that these real-life studies really need to have a gluten challenge because that's what's happening in real life. Patients are reporting symptoms because they're getting these little doses of gluten that may not always be little doses. And so it's quite unfortunate that those two very large studies, the real life studies of these medications were not really successful studies because the real life of a patient with celiac disease is not being involved in a study. So what about enrolling patients in the gluten challenge? I think we've all been very impressed with how generous the patients are and how they realize the significance of participating in these studies to develop a therapy. But patients really need to understand the significance of the challenge. And I think we're all rather chagrined when it became apparent that drugs had to improve patient symptoms because we know that patient symptoms are so variable. And growing up with celiac disease, we were so fixated on the biopsy results and that the drugs, when developed, had to protect against the development of villus atrophy and damage. But the studies indicate that the FDA indicates that symptoms are necessary to de demonstrate improvement for drug approval. And, but we're so very much aware that patients really can't pick gluten from placebo. And when patients are involved 
in a study, they report symptoms because there's this large placebo and nocebo effect. I'd be very interested in the mechanism. Banner alluded to them and Chaitin might discuss the mechanisms of the response to the short challenge versus the more prolonged tissue damaging challenge. And Jason did address that. Now there are good clinical practices for how to maintain safety in these clinical studies in which we ask patients to enter studies and to ingest gluten that we're trying to talk them out of ingesting on a daily basis. So candidates are so selected based on their medical history and the entry criteria for each individual study. It's got to be emphasized that trial participation is op optional and will not affect their medical care. When involved in the study, we really need to listen to patients and monitor their symptoms and emphasize that they can withdraw from the study at any time. When a patient is in a study, we need to support them, we need to offer medications for symptoms and to understand that they will and often do get symptoms. Prior to entering the study, we need to discuss with patients what their symptoms are and what they expect. Like what do they report when they actually experience known exposures? And they're often very different to the daily symptoms that patients are getting. The symptoms may be mild or severe, intestinal or extraintestinal. I can recall one patient who had such severe symptoms and had such profound metabolic changes after participating in one of these studies that we enrolled him in. But it's only been one patient in all these studies that had really such severe symptoms that withdrew because of bona fide medical uh, indications. And for these clinical studies, when we're offering a drug and a dose of, uh, of gluten, you know, what's the dose that should be given? Uh, two grams, three grams, or do they have to have the 10 gram? And it's probably advisable for different studies to try to use the same dosage so that we can actually compare drug for drug. And how is it delivered? Patients want to eat bread, right? They want to eat their cookies. They want to have the pizza. But it's a study and they've got to understand that they may be receiving vital gluten in a slurry. It has got to be FODMAP free. The gluten and placebo, they need to be palatable. In some of the early studies, the patients didn't like the fact that the the dose that was given of either drug or placebo tasted so sweet. Um, now, the patients have got to um, receive something that's equivalent. The gluten probably has to taste much like the placebo and vice versa. What is very good now is that we do have available measurement of gluten immunogenic peptides, and it can be measured in the patient's stool and urine. Because we've got to make sure that if they are in a challenge study, if a challenge is involved in that study, that they are ingesting the gluten. Because we really don't know what's going on. Um, and with the medication, you can count the pills, et cetera, that they bring back. Um, but we've got to make sure that the patients are ingesting gluten. And they must realize that participating in a study doesn't give them license to go out. They must only use gluten-containing foods and materials that are supplied for the study. So a gluten challenge is really necessary because we really have a need to demonstrate that the drug protects against damage from gluten. And to enroll the patients, We've got to have the patients that have the symptoms on gluten exposure, but not get too sick. So the ideal patient 
is only a fraction of all these large number of patients that we see with celiac disease. The large number of asymptomatic patients that have not been included in the study. These patients are not often asymptomatic because while they're asymptomatic prior to diagnosis, they do experience symptoms of gluten exposure, the short-term exposure. And many of those patients don't qualify for the studies that have been undertaken because we've been enrolling patients that appear to have some damage. And these patients that might have no damage, but get this short-term gluten exposure symptomatology because most of the studies have required the presence of villus atrophy or positive serologies, indicating that the patients are getting gluten um, and therefore ideal candidates for that individual study. And it's most important that we try to encourage the patients to maintain their usual activities. Patients need to be looked after. We need to treat their symptoms. We need to reimburse them, particularly a place like New York, if they're driving in, parking is very expensive. Uh, we have to reassure the patients that there is no permanent damage to being exposed to gluten in this control situation. And we've really got to thank them for being involved. So I hope that I covered what I was asked to talk about. Um, so thanks for involving me, and thank you very much to the patients who participate in all these studies. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. This was a really excellent presentation. So our next speaker is uh, Chetan Koshla. He's a professor of uh, in, uh, chemical engineering and chemistry at uh, Stanford University. Uh, Koshland has really brought chemistry to biology and to understanding disease, uh, not only through the creation of institutes at Stanford, such as ChemH, but also uh, directly in celiac disease when in 2002 he provided in a seminal manuscript the uh, basis, the, the structural basis for um, uh, why gluten is a, a trigger, a driver for celiac disease. So, and, and that also led to the identification of proline endopeptidases as, as uh, being able to digest uh, gluten peptides that led then on to uh, clinical trials that Peter just discussed. So Chetan, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Bana. Uh, I have only a few slides because uh, there's not much one can say uh, after we've had that's left to say about gluten challenge after we've had uh, professors Solid tied in and Green uh, share their uh, perspectives. Uh, I was asked to speak specifically in the context of therapies. Uh, and so uh, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, I have a couple of disclosures at the bottom that uh, will uh, could be relevant. Uh, so Peter talked about using uh, gluten challenge and the pivotal, and actually even Ludwig referred to it as did Jason. Uh, there is a pivotal role that gluten challenges play in the development of celiac therapy as illustrated by this one early example in the context of latiglutinase, uh, the work done by our colleagues in Finland uh, to be able to demonstrate the activity of latiglutinase, which was back then known as ALV003 uh, in celiac disease patients. Uh, this is important because, uh, let me first remind you, Peter talked about this study, uh, so uh, I, I can be quick in this, but I, I want to remind you about what was actually done in this landmark study because it's important. 
Leading into the study, it was not known what would be an appropriate design of a gluten challenge. And so our friends in, in, the, in, in Finland actually went through a pre-study that is shown on the left of the slide, uh, where they systematically varied the amount of gluten that was used to be able to uh, 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 to to look for uh, uh, the the minimum amount of gluten that would be usable in the context of a six week gluten challenge. It was decided the decision of six weeks was made because of pragmatic therapeutic. Uh, pragmatic issues associated with the development of experimental therapeutics. Back then, there was only enough data, as is not uncommon, on ALV03, which was an experimental medicine. There was just enough safety data to allow six weeks worth of usage in human subjects. And so, the six-week gluten challenge was a fixed number for the study. And so the variable that our colleagues in Finland had to decode was what is the least amount of gluten that could be used in a six-week challenge uh, to be able to see a clear effect of gluten in a reasonable fraction of patients. And so on the left, what you're seeing is in panel A, the change in villus atrophy as measured by villus height to crypt depth ratio at one and a half grams of gluten, three grams of gluten, and six grams of gluten. And you see two things. First is that at each dose, you're seeing some drop in the villus height to crypt depth ratio but clearly the higher dose you go to, the more significant the drop in, uh, in, in villus height to crypt depth ratio. And so given this kind, and the same thing you're seeing in panel B when you look at the intraepithelial lymphocyte counts, which are also a relevant variable over there. Uh, the, the, the key question over here has then becomes, what's the right amount of gluten? And for that, you get into the question, how big a study do you want to do? Uh, so for this study, the decision was made given the power p-values from these different cohorts to go with two two grams, somewhere between one and a half and three grams of gluten. And they went with two grams. And you see to the right that that was a good decision because <clears throat> when you look at the placebo-treated arm, you see a strong drop, more or less uh, what one would predict from the, uh, from the calibration study on the left. One sees a strong drop in villus height crypt depth ratio. However, it is important to note that a substantial fraction of patients, about a third of patients, did not respond meaningfully to, uh, to, to, to this two gram gluten challenge. And therein lies the statistical consideration. How big a study do you are you prepared to do? Uh, uh, in order to get the the signal is and 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 is the increased discomfort to patients in going from two grams to say six grams uh, something that you can trade off against the size of the study. So these are the key questions that come up in the context of these study designs. Now, the other thing that's really valuable to note from a study design like the one that was pioneered by our colleagues in Finland is that in the landscape of experimental human biology, it is always gratifying when a protocol that you design that gives you a result is reproducible. And this was one of those rare cases where we had an opportunity 
uh, nearly a decade later in an entirely different geography, moving from Finland to Minnesota to do the same study with the same design and a few additional bells and whistles. And long story short, when one did a very similar study, in this case, it was Joe Murray's team in, uh, in, at, at the Mayo Clinic that did this study. Uh, where the, the, the only difference, meaningful differences in this study in terms of the design was the existence of a small placebo run-in prior to the six-week gluten challenge. And the reasons for that will become clear in a moment. But other than that, the basic design of the study was the same. It was a two grams per day gluten challenge for six weeks. And to first order the changes that were seen in villus height trip depth ratio, this 2.93 represents the median uh, villus height to crypt depth ratio that Joe Murray's team measured at the beginning of the study. So at the, at the screening biopsy point and 2.52 was the level they measured at the end of their six week gluten challenge. And what you see is that uh, there is a significant drop in this variable uh, from uh, over the six week period of a challenge in a placebo, but not a significant drop in the average value in the in in the patients. And you see something very similar uh, in the context of 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 the intraepithelial lymphocytes as well. And so within a statistical resolution, what this is telling you is that this relatively small study design of involving a few tens of, of celiac subjects that are relatively well controlled can be highly informative and highly reproducible. The couple of bells and whistles that uh, 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 his team was able to build into the study that were not available back when the original Finnish study was done was that by this point, there were reliable and validated symptom tools available. And so one could ask the question, is there a correlation between GI symptoms that uh, are experienced during the gluten challenge and the uh, and the changes in uh, and and the effect of 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 the uh, of 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 the drug. And again, over here you see this in the top right. You're seeing average symptoms plotted. Now symptoms are a lot more noisy, but nonetheless, the fact that you can get a signal out of these uh, out of these small studies is not only pointing out that the objective measurements associated with biopsy are useful in the context of a gluten challenge, but you can also get more subjective patient reported outcomes to be useful in the context of these large studies. So that was also gratifying. The last thing I wanna point out again, an, an advance that did not exist when the Finnish study was done, but uh, is, 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 uh, is, is available today. Uh, Peter mentioned the existence of urinalysis methods that allow uh, investigators to, to quantify the amount of gluten peptide in uh, in, in a subject's urine. And so in this study, Joe Murray and his team were able to also quantify the amount of gluten peptide in the urine of both placebo patients, patients who were treated with the placebo drug, as well as patients who were treated with latiglutinase. And you can see a statistically significant difference. Again, this is noisier data, uh, but it's nonetheless uh, quite remarkable. If you step back and ask how many 
chronic immune conditions are there where there is an experimental protocol that can give you objective measurements, changes in as little as six weeks of an investigational drug therapy uh, in as few as 40 patients, I think you'll be hard pressed to find another disease where that can be done. And that is something that we have the gluten challenge protocols that those on this in this conference as well as elsewhere have developed over the past couple of decades. <clears throat> uh, Latiglutinase is certainly not the only medicine, investigational medicine that has benefited from these gluten challenges protocols. Here's the data from our colleagues in Europe, uh, Detlef Schupa and Marku Maki and their team on a much larger study. This study involved about 150 celiac patients because these patients were grouped into four groups. And the basic question that was being asked over here is, could a transglutaminase inhibitor provide evidence for efficacy? And indeed, you, could, uh, you can see in this study compared to the placebo group the, 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 the data, this was also a six-week challenge. It was a little more than two grams of gluten used over the six weeks. It was on the order of three grams of gluten that was used. But you're seeing very similar types of statistics in the placebo group to the one you saw, to the ones you saw in both the, uh, the, the latiglutinase studies. Over a period of six weeks, some on the order of two thirds of the patients, their intestinal biopsies show clear changes as a result of this uh, low dose gluten. And that change is enough to provide an anchor to compare the effects of drugs or different doses, as is in this case, of the same drug. And so you can see that with as little as 10 milligrams of Z1227, you are seeing some statistical difference between the, you're seeing a number of the patients over here also show changes. But nonetheless, you are seeing a clear statistical difference. The p-value between these two cohorts is quite significant. And as you go to higher doses, that difference becomes even more pronounced. So the key take home that you want to take away from this, uh, this study is that we have gluten challenges to thank for a way to be able to develop, uh, to be able to test pilot an experimental medicine in a celiac patient. I think it's fair to say we're at a point right now in celiac investigational drug development where if you can also, if not only is it appropriate to say that if a drug shows an effect in a gluten challenge study of this sort, then it deserves to be investigated further. But I think the reverse could also be said. If a drug doesn't show an effect in a gluten challenge of this sort, then one of two things must be the case. Either one has to carefully look at whether the, the protocols used for the gluten challenge uh, uh, proof of concept study were rigorous enough and implemented well enough, or that drug is, was a good idea, but probably not worth investigating further. So that kind of confidence level is very rare, I have to say, across the, the landscape of drug development. And so when you have that, that is something to be celebrated in the celiac field. So if that is the problem, then what, what can you say about the... Uh, the, 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 the issues associated with gluten challenge, uh, pardon the pun in this slide. I would say there's really four issues associated with gluten challenge. 
The first one is the obvious one. I talk to many celiac friends and family members, and I think everybody, when I lean on them to participate in gluten challenges, has to provide some kind of a snarky comment about what exactly are you doing in this study. Uh, and uh, I think we can agree that a gluten challenge where somebody is asked to take a defined type of a gluten on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday before uh, with breakfast is not a great a, a, a great mimic of real life, especially, and this becomes particularly true if you're doing it over many, many months, which is something that one has to consider when one talks about uh, 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 late stage drug development. Uh, there's also, as Peter referred to, the challenges associated with recruiting patients and its corollary that sometimes a gluten challenge biases your study away from the population that you're most interested in studying, namely those who react most adversely to gluten. I think the most significant challenge in the context of therapeutic development with the concept of a gluten challenge is the one that Peter alluded to, which is we're not at the point, as yet at least, where the FDA considers a gluten challenge as a legit way to be able to develop, a, 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 to get, to get a, a, a celiac drug approved. And so you have to do things that go beyond uh, gluten challenges to be able to get a drug to be able to get an experimental drug evaluated in a manner where you have a shot at getting it approved from the agency. And so that really brings us to the crux of the question. Peter alluded to this uh, toward the end of the talk. Uh, in a very real sense, every celiac patient is going through a gluten challenge. There is inadvertent gluten. By now, it's plenty clear that a majority of celiac patients have a considerable amount of inadvertent gluten as part of their diet. The question is, can that be quantified? If it could be quantified, you could study gluten challenge in a much more reliable way. Uh, without having to introduce additional gluten in diet. Uh, Peter point, described this data from the, uh, from the paper uh, le, whose lead author was Jocelyn Sylvester that pointed out that even though normal people who don't have celiac disease are consuming sky high amounts of gluten as shown in the top three uh, panels of this, of this figure. Most celiacs, you can detect gluten by one of several measures. In this particular study, Sylvester and colleagues were using three different measures for detecting gluten in the diet of patients. They were using doggy bags, and taking those doggy bags with leftover foods or small aliquots of foods and analyzing them in a laboratory for gluten content. They were looking at stool from patients over a period of a week and asking for evidence of gluten in stool. And they were looking at urine and asking for evidence. The good news, well, it's not good news, but the, the, the point the key point of this paper was that in all three measures, you can clearly see that a patient is consuming gluten inadvertently. The bad news is that if you ask, so can I get a calibration curve of gluten? you'd be very hard pressed to convert 
any of these three measurements into a reliable measure of how much gluten uh, a, a patient is, is consuming. And if you can't tell how much gluten is going into the mouth of a given patient in a reliable manner, then inadvertent gluten consumption can't be a substitute for a legitimate controlled gluten challenge like the ones we've been seeing. So the key challenge is to find a way that is much more reliable than the tools we have today to be able to tell post hoc how much gluten did a patient consume in the past, whatever unit of time you care about, whether it's one hour, whether it's one day, whether it's one week. And as Bana pointed out, I'm a chemist, I think about molecules. And so the question I ask is, if you want a sensor for gluten, where are you gonna find one in the context of inadvertent gluten consumption? Well, it turns out that there are molecules in our bodies that are sensing gluten, in celiac patients at least. And a subset of them we're already using to clinical benefit, as you've heard this morning. So I group the universe of disease-relevant molecules that sense gluten that goes into a patient's mouth into two categories, primary sensors and secondary sensors. To my knowledge, there are only two primary sensors of gluten in a celiac patient. There's a protein called transglutaminase 2 that recognizes gluten, converts it into a deaminated gluten peptide, and the relevance of that modification is abundantly characterized thanks to work of Ludwig Solid and many others involved in the field. The other molecule that recognizes gluten straight out of the wheat field, so to speak, is an anti-gluten antibody in a patient. The relevance in contrast to transglutaminase, the, the pathogenic, pathophysiological relevance of that encounter remains to be elucidated. And so while that is a legit candidate for a sensor of gluten in a patient's uh, a body, it is hard to imagine what that correlation could be between sensing and response if you don't know the nature of the response. When you get one step past the primary sensors, the list of sensors starts to grow. So there's at least four examples of secondary sensor molecules one can think of. There's HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8, which we know very well in this disease. These aren't primary sensors. They're not sensing gluten out of the wheat field. They're sensing gluten that comes from transglutaminase's active site. The same thing is true for these DGP antibodies that we use. They're not primary sensors of dietary gluten, but they are very proximal secondary sensors. Probably the most powerful sensor, uh, secondary sensor is that T cell receptor that Ludwig Solid and Jason Tiden talked to you about. In fact, Jason showed you an excellent example of a readout from that T cell receptor sensor of gluten, which is interleukin 2. So to the extent one could take what the data that Ludwig and Jason showed you and someday perhaps develop a calibration curve between the amount of cytokine that is present in the gut of a celiac patient and the amount of gluten they consumed, that might be a very interesting type of a relationship.
In work in collaboration with the Jabri lab, we've recently shown that there is another receptor in the gut called the LRP1 receptor that is directly just like the T cell receptor is sensing gluten in the context of HLA-DQ2, the LRP1 receptor is sensing gluten in the context of TG2. So the latter two secondary sensor examples are somewhat different from the first two secondary sensor examples because HLA and DGP antibodies are detecting the product of a primary sensor. Whereas the latter two sensors, the two receptors, are detecting gluten while it's bound to another sensor. So this is that the, the, it's 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 a little bit of inside baseball, but it's something that could be quite relevant when you think about developing. So the thought I want to leave you with is the following: that one of these sensors before long could be harnessed to quantify gluten consumption. And this is key with a universal calibration curve. Because if you could get that, then you don't need a formal gluten challenge. I think we're still a ways away from there. And I think many people could argue it may not even be possible to get there. The only thing I would say in response to that is if you don't try, the answer is always no. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of this. Dr. Koshla, thank you so much. This was a fantastic talk and I really appreciate it. I want to welcome back our speakers from this second session and also introduce, we have heard his name a little bit today. Um, Dr. Joe Murray will also be joining us. So I just really quickly want to introduce uh, Joe Murray because he was not speaking at all today, although you've heard quite a bit about some of his studies. Um, Dr. Joseph Murray is um, a gastroenterologist at Mayo Clinic. He is the John and Shirley Berry uh, professorship in gastrointestinal science at the Mayo Clinic, and obviously um, a huge collaborator and influence in the celiac world. We are so happy to have you as part of our panel. So I just would love to, I wanted to put up our disclosure slide for all of our faculty here today, um, doing my job for our CME office, but I am going to take this down in a second and just welcome back Dr. Salad, Dr. Koshla, um, Dr. Green and Dr. Semrad, Dr. Jabri, Dr. Abadi, and Ritu Verma. We have a great big panel. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jabri to take over. Yeah. Uh, first, I would like to remind the audience that they can still put their questions into Q&A. So even as we are discussing, uh, don't hesitate to uh, put your questions. Uh, so... Uh, Maybe before starting to um, address this specific session, uh, we were thinking that Ludwig should address the question of the IgG, anti-TGG antibodies and what they mean, because there have been questions in the first session. The fact that you could can find them and uh, those patients are not celiac disease patients. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to log on to the to be taken myself, so I didn't listen to that part. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so um, you're right that these transglutaminase IgG antibodies are poor predictors, less specific than or less good predictors than IgA, but they are pretty good. I mean, still, you see that there is this associated with disease. Um, um, and uh, I think they... I think the clinicians are really looking for a very precise tool to make the diagnosis. So they are looking for anything that has high positive predictive value. Um, and that's the reason why IgA has become so much better. But the IgG is still a pretty good, pretty good predictor of, of uh, IgG antitransglutaminase antibodies are pretty good predictors. Um, exactly why they are not as good as IgA, I, I don't think I can uh, explain. We, when we looked into <clears throat> the antibodies and the plasma cells 
that produce these. There is less correlation between the IgA plasma cells in the gut and the circulating IG, IgA antibodies than IgG antibodies. And we concluded that it must relate to two facts, either that the IgG antibodies have gained more mutations, so the, the immune response has kind of developed, or the alternative uh, explanation was that these uh, B cells were primed somewhere else, so they are less related to the IgA cells. And maybe that is the reason. Maybe that there are some gluten peptides that... Uh, that meets transglutaminase somewhere else and that you prime these cells not in the gut but somewhere else. I, I don't think we can exclude that at this point. I think the question, Dr. Saleh, that came on from the first session was in a patient that is IgA sufficient as a mm -hmm. TTG IgA, a deamidated IgG, a deamidated IgA normal and, or within the normal range, and the biopsies are normal, but the TTG IgG is elevated. So from a clinical standpoint, we don't see any inflammatory changes in the gut on our biopsy. So whatever we can make out of that, what do we do but with how, that? Uh, but how frequent is that? So if you, I mean, and, and there was a discussion with Ben Lebel also on the IAD and transglutaminase antibody tests. And I think I disagree with the statement that all tests are equal. It's really dependent on the quality of the antigen. These antibodies recognize conformational determinants. And I think there is not super good quality control of whether the antigen are have preserved these epitopes, these conformational epitopes. So I wonder if you're using a really good assay, whether you will find patients or individuals who are IgG positive um, and who do not have celiac disease. So I would I would question the antibody tests before I really um, make that the truth. So I think we should step down that question and then get to the gluten giant. So that there are two, it seems uh, there are two parts to the session we just had. One is the role of gluten challenge and what it what it has brought. Uh, two clinical trials, and then the second part more for research uh, for clinical trials. So I would first like to go to the research part. What can, you know, what additional insights can gluten challenge studies bring to us today? So that would be a question. I would start with Ludwig. I think what is really good about these gluten challenge studies is that we can find reliable surrogate markers. And if you want to do drug testing, you want to have markers which tell inform you about the disease processes. And I think what we have learned from the gluten challenge studies have brought up a number of candidates. That is not to say that we can improve it and get even better markers for the disease activity. Um, so I think we should continue to use this very special case that we can challenge the immune system and get this recall response and really characterize the nuts and bolts of that, uh, which would I think will help us to de develop good treatments. And I have much better faith in these surrogate markers than uh, symptoms because symptoms are subjective and they are also included by sham challenge. So I think we, we, we are in a situation where we need to really harness this unique situation to understand everything that is going, uh, happening as part of this immune response. And I'm sure there are things we still have to learn. Uh, having said that, I think there is one important point which was partly addressed during the talks. And that is that these acute responses are not the same as you have when you have a, if you're eating gluten over a long period of time. So I'm still, I think the real challenge is to get surrogate markers, which you can transform from short term gluten challenge into being meaningful when patients are exposed to gluten for a long period of time. I'm, I'm, I think there must be markers which reliably connect this, but we are not there uh, to fully understand that. Okay, so I uh, maybe I'll, thanks, Ludwig. Maybe I'll, I'll rephrase my question and maybe Chetan can start. I feel that there are still a number of questions uh, that are key uh, for celiac patients and that we uh, still don't understand. What causes the 
acute reactions to celiac disease, such as nausea and vomiting, that really uh, impact the uh, everyday life of uh, patients and make them fearful uh, to go to uh, restaurants and social activities. What uh, are the underlying mechanisms of brain fog uh, that uh, people describe? Um, and you know maybe other questions. Uh, what? How can we explain that when you challenge and can we take advantage of gluten challenges, where fifty percent of the patients will develop villus atrophy and fifty percent will not, in order to better understand the mechanisms that underlie development of tissue damage or predispose more to tissue damage. So, uh, Chetan, regarding this part of the question that is not directly linked to clinical trials, but you know, can have an impact on clinical trials. What do you think that we can learn from uh, those gluten challenge studies? Because I just want to re-put in context, this has been a, discussed a lot today, but the discovery that you have early I2 release, uh, and, and that is specific to T cells came from gluten challenges in the context of uh, studies. And not only has that brought more insights into our understanding, but it has helped even clarify the difference between gluten sensitivity and celiac disease, and now goes on to serving to diagnostic. So the question I'm asking is how can we use today gluten challenges to further our understanding uh, and therefore you know, even expand more the, the clinical arsenal, which is not just about preventing villus atrophy, but also improving the acute symptoms in response uh, to gluten contamination. So Chetan, if you want to take this yeah, one. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think so far, 99% of the well-controlled, well-designed, well-executed gluten challenges that I have seen in the literature and discussed, you heard discussed by our peers in the field, have been focused with their primary and possibly even their secondary and maybe even exploratory outcomes on the immunopathogenesis of celiac disease. Uh, but there's a lot more to this disease as is perceived by the patient than, <laughs> than, than the immunopathogenesis. And we have no understanding of mechanisms. And what confounds that is the vast heterogeneity of those sequelae of gluten consumption, both acute and chronic. I have no doubt that each of those sequelae are at some level, they have a mechanistic foundation. Uh, Yes, maybe there are some effects of gluten that are in a patient's head, but I think there's a lot more mechanisms that are in the patient's gut that we don't understand. And there are probably a lot more mechanisms somewhere between a patient's gut and their head, like in their liver or in their kidney or in other organs that we don't understand. So... I think the next generation, and I here I have to give a shout out to the University of Chicago and Mayo Clinic's collaboration in this upcoming uh, gluten challenge study because it's it takes the 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 opportunity of us understanding the consequences of gluten in celiac disease to a celiac patient to a different level, not just by the sophistication of the design, but also by two other variables. The fact that you are looking over an extended period of time. And so you get to see both acute and chronic features, but equally importantly, you're not just looking at challenge, you're also looking at de-challenge phase of that. And not many people so far have done that in using the same kind of rigor as they've used for the challenge portion of the study. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of going beyond immunopathogenesis in the design of the next generation of challenge studies. 
Joe, do you want to maybe comment and then maybe yeah. also address the question of Lisa Hill about the long-term health risks associated with long-term accident sure. exposure? So, so, both. Yep, so delighted. Um, the I, when I think of a challenge, I think of you know, the potential as we get more sophisticated, we think about the dynamics or kinetics of the response over time. We know with many inflammatory responses, you get maximal effector response very quickly, but then you generate some level of tolerance. And I think there's even adaptation and compensation that can occur when patients have been exposed to gluten long term. So while those mechanisms we think are inadequate to completely regulate the response, it might explain why a lot of patients have severe injury, eat a lot of gluten and have been doing so for a long time, but don't seem to have substantial symptoms. So I think there is the potential from challenge studies to help us in a lot more sophisticated insight into what happens over time, either after a single challenge or repeated challenge, either daily or after. Um, now that also then leads into Lisa's question about what are the consequences of long-term exposure? Well, it depends on how much and for how long. It might also depend on whether it's intermittent or daily. If it's a very frequent, you're going to get chronic inflammation with destruction. Uh, the consequences of that could be malabsorption symptoms, malabsorption consequences like deficiencies, but also long-term consequences of inflammation of the risks, perhaps of malignancy that could occur with it long-term. What happens with more intermittent exposures where you may get these IL-2 associated symptoms um, is not so clear what that long-term consequence is. If you don't generate a high level of chronic inflammation, you may never get malabsorption symptoms. But can it affect other things like neuroenteric function responses or even neurologic, neurologic or neuroimmune responses outside of the gut and affect things like uh, people's um, you know, sense of well-being, for example. So we really don't understand enough about what those short, medium, and long-term consequences of gluten exposure are as yet. Though we do know at the extreme ends, we get complete healing and resolution, hopefully also resolution of symptoms, versus patients who get the worst complication of disease. But we know very little about the spectrum in between. No, thanks, Joe. And again, I think it's very important to separate those uh, different parts. Valerie, you want to take the follow-up of questions? We can uh, have the, there's an additional um, question in the chat that we can maybe ask Carol uh, or Peter to answer. Do we know if subtypes of celiac like bulba or ultra short celiac or refractory celiac have different cytokine involvement levels? I don't think we do. Um, it always, uh, like this adaptive phenomenon that's been alluded to, uh, that patients um, chronically don't have IL-2 elevation. You know, it, they have to be on the gluten-free diet for a period of time prior to gluten inducing an elevated IL-2 value. Um, we looked at cytokines quite a while ago and the most frequently elevated cytokine was uh, interferon. Uh, and that was higher in the patients that were most symptomatic and also had other autoimmune conditions. Um, but, you know, it just, it interests me such a lot that the gluten challenge in someone who has active celiac disease doesn't result in increased IL-2. What was the mechanism of that? Banner, do you know? L Ludwig is there also, but I, I think... Uh... You know, one interesting question is, uh, do you get this release of I2 in the serum because you are engaging memory T cells who are circulating and that are get reactivated in lymph nodes uh, rather than the chronic activation of T cells within tissues that, uh, you know, where the I2 is being absorbed immediately and being used locally. And therefore, you cannot see the release uh, as easily into the serum. 
So uh, I, again, I think that uh, uh, what, what all these gluten challenge and clinical trials have brought to us is, is a much better understanding, and I would say separation of different components of what celiac disease is, which is, you know, abnormal immune response to gluten, but that also encompasses, as Joe has alluded, probably other factors uh, like serotonin release, uh, other mediators by mast cells, et cetera. But, uh, and that there's a difference between chronic tissue activation and activation of circulating cells. But I, I let Ludwig uh, take it from there. Um, I think I agree with you. I think when you do a, a gluten challenge in your patients who have been gluten free or a person who's been gluten free, you get the concerted action. So there are many cells becoming activated at the same time, and you can see this peak in serum. Whereas if you have a more continuous stimulation, some cells will be refractory and don't release IL-2. But even though even though there could be cytokines, I don't think you necessarily would measure it as a peak in serum or plasma. I wonder if there is more than one uh, type of celiac disease. Um, we do see individuals that have this ultra-short celiac disease with severe villus atrophy, localized just to the bulb, and a totally normal second part of the duodenum. Do they have the same disease um, as someone who has all the duodenum involved? Uh, again, I think these are interesting questions because you, you can ask the question, does, does the extent of celiac disease have to do with frequency of the gluten-specific T-cells and uh, you know how much uh, of them there are? So is there any correlation there? Or is that more the reflection of the local environment? Because we know that gluten CD4-specific T-cells are not enough to induce tissue damage and that you need to have local stress signals. So does it reflect a difference in the local environments that uh, become more permissive for tissue damage? Uh, you know, again, th this would be interesting to study and, uh, and, and just points to the fact that even though we know a lot, we, there's still a lot to understand. Can, uh, can you comment on potential celiac disease? What, what's the difference in the... Uh findings there, because many of those people lose their antibodies over an extended period of time. I'll, I'll let Ludwig answer because I'm the moderator, okay. not the speaker, so Ludwig. <laughs> no, I, um, I, I think I, I echo what Bana said, that it's a complex disease and it's genetically also not, people have different pre, uh, degree of susceptibility genes, which I think will flesh out in slightly different immune responses. So it's it's going to be heterogeneous. Not everyone will be the same. Exactly when they start to make antibodies and how this is connected to T cells, I don't think we, we don't fully understand. I don't think you will get the antibodies unless you have T cells. But I think that's something we feel pretty sure about. But how that, trans sorry, that translates into different magnitude, I think there's still a lot we don't understand. I have another question. Um, the individual's response to the challenge, does that reflect anything about the nature of their celiac disease, their clinical presentation, their initial biopsy findings? Um, is there any information about how the result of the challenge reflects the nature of the celiac disease? Which aspect of challenge are you referring to, Peter? IL-2? Um, and uh, both, both that and also the development of villus atrophy. So what do you think, Ludwig? Do you think the IL-2 levels are dependent on the back, uh, the background of the patient at the time they receive a challenge? Uh, yes, to some extent. I think Jason showed that um, if you are DQ2 homozygous, you tend to respond more vigorously. But I think it's dependent on how much gluten uh, DQ2 complex is actually represented in the T cells. And one thing we don't know is where these T cells that produce IL-2 are sitting. Some of them are sitting in the gut mucosa, 
but I assume that some of them are also sitting in organized lymphoid tissue in mesenteric lymph nodes or in, uh, in the gall to get associated lymphoid tissue. And, uh, and although we can take biopsies and measure how many T cells there are, we can take blood and measure how many T cells are, there are, there's still a lot we don't monitor. And I think without having that into your uh, fiscal, uh, into your spreadsheet, I think it will be hard to make a, a very precise. Uh, I think about this question almost every day when I diagnose an individual who is asymptomatic and then they develop symptoms when they've been on the diet for a period of time and they're exposed to gluten. You know, I just wonder like what we're doing in that setting. I, I think that could possibly relate to this peak in cytokines, that these symptoms are related to the actual concentration of the cytokines. And if you are on a continuous gluten diet, you're producing the cytokines, but they don't peak and you don't get the same symptoms. That would be a very simple explanation, and I won't refute that. Uh, I, I would like to go back to uh, something important I think that Chetan said and, and, and that maybe we should discuss is what are we looking at with a short gluten challenge, uh, you know, of uh, just one time uh, gluten challenge versus a six week challenge versus multiple month uh, gluten challenge? And uh, when is there a role for these different types of gluten challenges and uh, what can we learn from them? Uh, Joe, or, and then maybe Chetan and Carol. Sure, Firm. Um, well, when I think about these very short duration challenges in patients who are well treated, and I think that's been the paradigm for a lot of these very early proof of concept studies for drug trials, is you're looking at a very different setting. And I think as Ludwig has pointed out, you're de dealing with probably re um, these memory cells that can have this uh, abrupt response that we've typified with IL-2, but involves other cytokines and probably other cells, but without producing any destruction, um, any mucosal destruction at all. And it probably is not predicted by the patient's original presentation. Because of course, when we see somebody clinically, and make a diagnosis of celiac disease, we are seeing them after a lifetime of gluten exposure to varying degree. And it's not only whatever was the acute response to gluten, but they've had a chronic adaptation that's occurred over that time. And I've always believed, whether it's true or not, you, you, you can even get anatomic adaptation. You were people of so-called jejunalization of the distal small intestine that it kind of makes up for in some to some degree what didn't what what wasn't working right in the proximal small intestine which was damaged but all of those compensatory mechanisms go away once you treat somebody so doing those acute challenges in people who are essentially doing very well is very different from for example having somebody increase their gluten who has already been e um, eating gluten and that's certainly been a, a, a an approach where you have somebody who I won't say is on the potential celiac spectrum, but has some maybe increased lymphocytosis, but intact architecture, but they've got antibodies. Maybe they have some symptoms and they've been eating a low gluten diet. You increase their gluten and voila, they start getting significant damage. Um, I think we need a lot more info about repeated challenges mm -hmm. and what those effects are when those are repeated at intervals other than daily. You know, when we're looking at weekly, and there are now some studies out there that are, are involving exposures of patients to weekly or even uh, you know weekly gluten, and what effect that could have in terms of magnification or amplification. So that's kind of my take on what I think um, these. I mean, I would hope we would get to doing challenges that are what I call zero day challenges, where we don't do any challenge to the patient. We challenge their immune system ex vivo or in vitro. Ludwig? So uh, following up on Joe's comment, I think what would be useful is to have trials or drug designs where you continue gluten in patients who are untreated at the time when they get the diagnosis and you follow whether the drug actually can resolve the disease. And I think antibodies would be pretty good measures because antibody and the titer so antibodies they drop quickly so i think you can do to see what your drug actually is will will be effective in treating an ongoing disease 
and that should supplement to the challenge studies because I think they will report on different um, aspects of the disease. But I think if they are going into the same pathogenic mechanisms, it should be effective in both instances. Uh, would, uh, what do you think about uh, the following notion? And then we, we need to answer one additional question that's in, in the chat uh, uh, about more potential celiac disease. Um, if one has a drug that targets the CD4 gluten-specific T cells, would a short-term gluten challenge with IL-2 release be an effective way to ask the initial question is the give a proof of principle uh, that this drug is working, yes or no. And if a drug is more focusing on the later stages of the mechanism of celiac disease that look at the effector T cell response that directly destroys the epithelial cells and, uh, and involves intraepithelial lymphocytes, then this early analysis of gluten challenge and I2 release would not be helpful and the only readout would be actually villus atrophy. So what I'm trying to get at, and maybe Chetan can take that, is how should we adapt the gluten challenges and the readouts we are using to the actual uh, uh, therapy that we are testing? And how does this go in the context of what you know, FDA has been proposing? Yeah. So I'm going to give a pragmatic answer to that question, Bana. I've now been involved in fundraising for half a dozen or more experimental medicines for celiac disease. Uh, I think it's not a good idea for us to deviate from the foundational gluten challenge proof of concept trial design for the first early testing of any medicine that we are contemplating for this disease. I think the kinds of questions that you're asking should be answered through additional measurements or, or side studies to the parent study uh, and not in lieu of that parent study. I think by now that core, whether you take a two week or four week or six week gluten challenge, we can debate about that, whether you do two grams or four grams or six grams, we can also debate about that. But the, 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 the effort to bring an experimental medicine into patient facing studies is just so Herculean. Uh, it is best if we de-risked that, pro uh, that, 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 that experimental agent through the protocol that we have that's really robust by now because it's just been run so many times across so many medicines, including ones where it hasn't worked, but even those have provided us very useful data. So I feel like for pragmatic reasons alone, it is that is not the place to be creative. That's all I will say. So you are saying that the villus atrophy is a key endpoint. It is. If if here's the thing. If there's a really, I I can I can imagine that someday some creative scientist could could create some uh, an experimental agent that will genuinely add value to the health and life of a celiac patient, but will not do anything to their, to their small intestinal villi. In other words, they'll be damaged just the same way with gluten as they would be without the medicine. I can imagine that kind of an agent being created someday. I don't know of any that are there right now in the pipeline, but it's possible. If that were to happen, then your question starts to become relevant. But I think so long as there is a correlate between your primary mode of action and villus atrophy, there's just so much robustness in that short-term gluten challenge study that I feel it would be a mistake for an investigator to say, well, to heck with that, we'll just come up with a creative untested protocol. 
the risk is too high, in my opinion. Uh, Ludwig and Joe? So and to follow up on that, I mentioned for you um, the that these T cells the, that are gluten specific become activated and express CD thirty eight. You can, this marker also drops very quickly when patients are put on a gluten free diet. So I can see that you can follow those cells during activation. Follow as Jaden said, you do a gluten challenge and you kind of monitor that. And I agree that you probably should do histology to see damage, but you can also then very quickly go to the patients who are have active disease and see whether the drug can prevent the activation of these T cells. Yeah, that's if you don't the... see that, then if you don't see that, I think you have a problem. And I think that's my point. You, you need to make good surrogate markers, which you can assess in both situations. Joe, you wanted to say something? Yep. Um... So uh, to follow up on Chayton's point about that, you know, the the workhorse now of the early proof of mechanism of effect studies is this challenge, is the gluten challenge, a pro more prolonged gluten challenge with hard endpoints of villus high crypt depth as an outcome, which I think is a very robust challenge. But that's a lot to ask people to undergo. And a lot of patients, a large proportion of the celiac community will refuse to undergo it. So you almost are setting yourself up when if you if you set your your point of decision on that and a relatively small subgroup of patients who are willing to do those prolonged challenges. And if it works in those, that doesn't necessarily mean it'll work in the patients who are much more sensitive. Um, so I would make the case that there is a point for having much shorter term challenges like the one day or the three day challenges. If the outcome measure that you're using or the surrogate marker you're using reflects the mechanism of action of your agent so that you can better judge what would be an effective dose to then test in the much more expensive, much more prolonged, and perhaps less representative, um, you know, 12-day, 15-day, 30-day, 40-day challenge. Um, so I think there is a role for these, but they need to be tailored to the mechanism of action and they have to be informative in terms of how we set doses. And we're seeing more and more agents that have never been in humans before that are coming first in human and celiac patients. And that's a circumstance where we need the, to have some notion of dose ranging effect. Um, and that's where those surrogate measures and very short term challenges may be helpful. But I agree with Chayton. Ultimately, you have to have a very robust test to show that the drug is likely to work and be worth the trouble of going to the continued clinical development. But can I just say something from a clinical point of view? So how do we translate the meaning of a little less villous atrophy than before with an effective drug for treating a disease? In other words, do we have any evidence that that's going to make their life better, their risk for downstream cancers or other diseases better, if there's still a degree of inflammation and villous atrophy, and we're just looking at these little changes that are significant or not. That's that's part of what I don't quite have a handle how drugs are going to be better. I think but you're asking a question, Carol, that is a question that transcends any individual drug. Yeah. Uh, it is true for any experimental medicine. You could ask that question that 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 prevents the collapse of villi in response to gluten. I think one has to separate that question. There's such a huge risk associated in the first celiac facing experiment that you do with an experimental agent that is so drug specific that you have to separate questions like what you were asking from that first experiment that you do. You have to make as close to a ideally controlled sort of reagent grade. And this brings me to my response to Joe's question. Joe, I, I completely understand the challenges with recruiting patients for challenge, probably more than most people do. Uh, but are you telling me that it's impossible to find 40 patients 
who are willing to, who are generally in good health and are willing to undergo challenge for a new, new medicine. If it's hard to find 40 patients who, who meet that criterion, then I've got to ask, is it worth developing medicines in the first place? Yeah, I, I, it is possible. And certainly we've done it. We did it in the midst of COVID. Uh, it is possible to do that. Is it always justified, though, as a first proof of effect in an ultra new drug? I mean, a drug that has no precedence in humans, an entirely new method. I'm not so sure that it, it justifies endoscopy, the expense of all of those patients, also the use of all of those patients. If you could answer questions earlier, or even choose what the most effective dose is likely to be by using shorter term exposures. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it becomes, it's now becoming a much more crowded field in terms of um, various developmental uh, approaches to treating celiac disease. I do think we need to think about, at least for those surrogate measures, they need to be appropriate for the mechanism of action. Yeah, I, I think where, where I can see what Joe is saying is, for, for instance, if you have a drug that says that it's going to delete gluten-specific CD4 T cells or prevent them from becoming activated, and you have the same amount of I2 released upon a short-term gluten challenge, would that be enough to say this drug is not working and it's not worth moving to a prolonged gluten challenge? I, I think that would be an example uh, I think of what Joe is saying, but again, uh, you know that that goes back to, uh, you know, how should be we be using gluten challenges? And but I agree with you, Chetan, that once there is an established protocol and we want, you know, to move on with with clinical trials, it's it's very important to keep standards. So, uh, just because there is one question we didn't address, and I and there were not many questions. Does somebody want to take the question about um, the, uh, I, there's another one that came up. Where's the other, there, there was a question. There, there are a few. So yeah. from, uh, it's, it's name anonymous attendee. So I think it was referring to actually potential celiac disease patient. Uh, and there's the, he had a, the question that uh, was kind of uh, addressed, but do genetic factors influence cytokine responses in celiac? Uh, so it, it refers, I think, to the, the Commander Ludwig from Jason uh, studies with the DQ2.2. But Ludwig, if you want to uh, uh, re answer this question, that so do genetic factors influence cytokine response such as to release? So, so we didn't know that the dose of DQ matters whether there are any other genes that matters we don't know and what should be said is that the effect size of these non-hla genes compared to hla is really small so maybe their biological effect in such a readout also will be very hard to detect there's another question on interferon uh, is, is interferon if and interferon is elevated in more symptomatic patients is there any treatment focusing on decreasing this response yeah, I, I can take that. I think there are anti-interferon, gamma interferon antibodies. And in principle, you could give them the current versions have long half-lives and that presents a risk in those kinds of in those kinds of situations because they tend to be immunosuppressive, which is not to say you can't make a short acting anti-interferon or anti-interleukin type of antibody to be able to counter those acute effects. The question is to what lengths would you go through to shore up an existing experimental protocol? It's like standing, uh, I mean, it's a pragmatic question. I mean, in theory, what the, uh, what the questioner is asking is doable. In practice, it may be very challenging to justify. And of course, steroids will do that. True. Uh, then there's the question about patients with persistent elevated serology, but MARSH zero and normal capsule, whether symp symptomatic or not. Um, well, I can challenge, I can take that one. So the um, if the patients are not symptomatic, well, I typically, well, maybe they have 
potential celiac disease. And I will usually advise no change in their diet and follow up um, to see if they change their phenotype, if it advances or not. Certainly in our studies, a lot of them will revert back to zero negative. Now, whether that's permanent or not is another question. It's a little too trickier when you're dealing with the symptomatic patients who have positive antibodies, but for example, have MARSH zero, not even any increase in intrapathy lymphocytosis. What do you do with those patients? And I'd have to individualize those, assuming they carry an appropriate HNA type for celiac disease, and they do not have another obvious explanation for their symptoms. I will treat them with the trial of a gluten-free diet to see if they feel better. On the other hand, if they're symptomatic and they have MARSH-1 I would, and they're positive antibodies, I would be much more in favor of treating those patients than not, even accounting for the vagaries of things like histologic interpretation, which can be difficult. I, I think that's one of the things on a gluten-free diet, uh, diagnosed, we do see that patient who's in follow-up, got an elevated TDG, but biopsy is normal and the capsule is normal. Uh, that patient, um, we just reassure and say something like, well, maybe that's their baseline TDG, because if their biopsy is normal and the capsule is normal, you know, I tell them they can't do any better than they're, they're doing. I suppose the challenge there is if they're symptomatic and you don't have another explanation for their symptoms, is a trial of a gluten-free diet justified? I think this patient is already on a gluten-free diet. I would suggest a visit with a dietitian. Um, you know, obviously there could be other reasons as well uh, causing that elevated TTG, but I think the visit, especially if you're symptomatic, um, would be a good idea to see your dietitian as well. I think I just saw a patient interesting on this. She had a weak positive TTG biopsy 10 years ago because her daughter had celiac disease. 10 years later, she comes to me with new onset scleritis, same weak positive TTG, and now she's got villus atrophy and inflammation. So it really, this length of time where people can go years before something more happens. That's what worries me about those patients. <laughs> but I, I, they exist out there. And the quite, some developed DH as that study I showed, three patients 10 years out eating gluten, nothing except they developed DH. So they can develop other extra intestinal things, I think, autoimmune or otherwise. I don't know if others seen that. So it makes me nervous. My question is, can... Is there any of these more sensitive biomarker studies to put such patients through other than to say your histology looks okay? Would those be patients to look at some other more sensitive markers uh, or to do one of these massive challenges, you know, give them some massive amount and look for IL-2 or something? I don't know. Is there, that would be a nice group to study because they're out there. Banner, what's the nature of your study that you're proposing or you're going to start? Sorry? Uh, you're I, going to do a challenge study? Ah, yeah, asking what the University of Chicago is doing. Yes, so we, we obtained a high-impact uh, uh, ARC2 grant um, where we are going to do challenge and de-challenge studies on patients that will be recruited from the Mayo Clinic and from the University of Chicago, and that will combine transcriptional clinical uh, microbiome uh, studies. And the idea is um, to use those challenge and de-challenge studies to get better insights into what causes tissue damage uh, taking advantage of the heterogeneity of the response, but also what are the mechanisms that underlie uh, tissue healing. So uh, that's the purpose of, uh, you know, the, those clinical trials. I, I think we need to wrap up. Uh, Valerie, is there something you want to say before I... No, I think we, we answered all the questions. Okay. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody. I think this has been... Uh, a interesting and productive discussion. Thank you to all the participants. I hope that, you know, I think for everything that has been said, uh, we we can take uh, maybe a few home, take-home messages. One is that gluten challenges are very useful 
and important in the context of clinical trials, but that they have also brought important insights into uh, disease pathogenesis, but also new ways of maybe diagnosing uh, celiac disease. Uh, we also heard that one has, has to be careful that this involves patient participation. There should be no pressure put on those patients, that the only real contra I mean, contraindications may be pregnancy and gluten ataxia, but that beside that, uh, it's uh, more up to the uh, patient and the severity of the symptoms that those patients feel, which may actually also means that likely patients participating in those studies will be patients who have low levels of symptoms, which may create actually in the bias of the nature of the patients uh, entering those studies. And I think we should be uh, aware of that. Um, and uh, and I think we, uh, we, sh we have to really emphasize the fact that celiac disease is a very unique disease that can bring a lot of insights to other disorders because we have a way of really controlling the driving antigen and therefore to uh, really uh, be able to follow the disease process, but also really get a very good objective insights into the efficacy of a given treatment. So, um, but there's still a lot to learn. And I think uh, the future will also uh, maybe have us use those gluten challenges to address other questions of acute symptoms and brain fog. Uh, and also likely in the future, as Chetan has said, with the existence of parallel studies, maybe we will be able to better and better adapt the type of clinical trial and the type of gluten challenge to the type of drug that is being tested and also maybe envision different types of gluten challenges for phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical uh, trials. So thank you, everybody. And um, uh, I wish a happy Thanksgiving for the people in the United States. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again uh, for another CELAC symposium at the University of Chicago.